Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, Episode 2, Monkey Business. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my co-host, the lovely Michelle Whalen. Aw, aren't you sweet. So today we have a couple of interesting things we're going to be talking about. The first of which is the unfortunate and untimely death of the former monkey, Peter Twerk, at age 77. Also happened to be my favorite monkey of the four. And I think a lot of people would say that. Mm -hmm. He had cancer. He was diagnosed in 2009 with uh, adenoid cystic carcinoma, which is a form of mouth cancer. I wasn't able to find any details about his medical status after that statement. Um, But the stated cause of death was cancer in Mm -hmm. this case. How does that make you feel? You know, it's funny, as you get older and people that you either looked up to or role models or, you know, celebrities or whatever, you know, things from your childhood start, you know, they start passing away, you kind of almost get a sense of your own mortality, you sure, know, yeah. it's it's one thing, you know, and, and the fact that, you know, he was only 77, that's really not old, No, you know these days that's that's still you know fairly young um you know and it's just kind of like you know and and i'm sure people that were you know big fans of the beatles you know when john lennon passed away you know or was killed and you know george harrison it's kind of like oh you know i think it was george harrison probably had the most impact because it was a natural death right you know, obviously Lennon's Lennon was, assassination it was, was, it traumatic. was tragic, right? But you know, when when someone passes away of natural causes at seventy seven, it does tend to to uh, have you look at your own mortality. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And we've only got two members of the monkeys left: mm-hmm. Mickey Dolans and Michael Nesmith are left. Right, and you know, and I actually saw them in concert. Back when Michael wasn't touring with them, yeah, um, when it was the three. Um, the three members at the time. And it was always one of those concerts I always wanted to see again. You know, the music, you know, was corny, but it wasn't. You know, the television show only ran for two seasons, but has such a a cult following. Um, Well, that's the interesting thing. People look back at the television show and the fact that it was manufactured. In fact, the, the... nickname the monkeys got was the prefab for right absolutely um and they were they took a lot of heat for the the image of not being musicians not playing their own songs when in fact two of the members were actual musicians peter tork being one Mm -hmm. of them michael nesmith being actual musicians right and after the band broke up in 68 Mm -hmm. um Peter Tork went on to start right. his own band, had mm-hmm. his own career, and, and, you know, he was reluctant to be typecast as a monkey right. moving forward. Mm-hmm. And while that did cause a bit of a rocky road career-wise right, for Right, every him, now and then, right. Um, in the 80s, 90s, and, and aughts, he, he would come back occasionally, mm-hmm. usually once a decade for a reunion tour for him. Absolutely. So he did have a keen appreciation for... Mm-hmm. The notoriety and status oh, absolutely. that I gave him. So, very sad to see his passing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next thing on the hit list here is uh, the movie Neverland, the documentary Neverland that HBO was going to be premiering. This is a four-hour documentary that's going to be aired in two parts on March 3rd and 4th. Featuring two similarly parallel accounts of Michael Jackson's alleged sexual predation. So this actually follows the story of two of his accusers. Um, It premiered at Sundance uh, to an outcry from fans and supporters of Jackson as being a 
quote-unquote public lynching of Jackson. So clearly there's a lot of controversy surrounding this. Um, the accusers themselves have offered conflicting statements at one point in time stating, one of them at least stated that he was not unequivocally not molested, who was now retracting that for the purposes of this movie, apparently. Mm -hmm. um, the Jackson Estates already filed a lawsuit against HBO to try to stop the airing. Uh, they are citing a breach of a 1992 non-disparagement agreement that HBO had signed with a with uh, that the Jackson uh, uh, family, I guess, had signed with HBO, basically saying HBO would not say any disparaging remarks or air any disparaging footage uh, of Michael Jackson or any of the other members of the family. So HBO is moving forward with it. They're they're going to broadcast it. What are your thoughts on that? I don't know. In in some cases. You know, at this point, it's been so long, you know, and Michael Jackson's been gone for, for quite a while now. And I think overall, everybody has a feeling that there was something that was going on. Um, you know, when when you look back at, you know, how many children would, you know, spend the week, spend the night... And the parents had no problem doing it. And then how many payouts went to, you know, different families, you know, as as hush money. You know, it's pretty much you're guilty right there. If you're, you know, paying out, you know, half a million dollars, million dollars to, you know, to families, something was going on that, that shouldn't have been. Um, well, and, and to play devil's advocate, officially Michael Jackson's never been convicted of a crime. Uh, he was acquitted in 2006 of allegations and you know payouts come in very different forms uh there were accounts where family members left their children the children begged to stay at neverland with mm -hmm. jackson and jackson paid for palatial vacations for the rest of the family oh absolutely um which you can look at that in, from many he, different. He angles. was definitely charitable when it came to to that. You know, the the children, you know, in most cases were less fortunate, and this was, you know, obviously a a dream come true. And was everybody molested? No, I don't think so. You know, I I you know, and I'd like to hope that none of them, in some way, were. And you know, maybe. You know, it, it wasn't. There were there were allegations for quite some time of impropriety by by Michael Jackson. You've had some high profile people come out who were in similar, you know, we'll say intimate situations in which, and even Jackson admitted in a couple of interviews, you know, he thought it was okay to have these minors sleeping in bed with him because he thought it was a beautiful thing. Right, and I think for him, too, because of his childhood or lack of childhood, you know, he was thrown into the entertainment industry at such a young age and was basically forced to grow up. I think in a lot of cases where a normal 40-year-old adult wouldn't want to, you know, have a slumber party, for him, he was really still a 10-year-old boy in this 40-year-old's body right you know look at you know how you know he he modeled neverland to look at like disneyland he was you know big time you know disney fan and and a kid really right. and it was basically him just living his childhood out so yeah for him he you know he didn't see anything wrong and you know it, it kind of makes me wonder how many parents fabricated you know, the the stories to to extort, you know, and, money. And that certainly is another angle when you're someone of notoriety, someone of wealth, it makes you a target of people who want to take advantage of that. Absolutely. That's, that's certainly not an acquittal of anything he might have done. Right. Um, but, you know, it doesn't take but one voice of suspicion uh, to start the accusations flying. Absolutely. So let me ask you this, though. Do you think HBO is within its right to air this program? I don't see why not. 
you know, I don't know what the statute of limitation is, you know, 92, you know, was that a, you know, a 10 year, 20 year, 30 year? Well, the Jackson estate is, is claiming that it was impropriate, uh, in perpetuality. So there should be no statute of limitations on this agreement they signed. Mm. Um, but let me ask you another question. Do you think it serves a purpose at this point? We're coming out. This is really the 10 year anniversary of Jackson's death. Clearly, any victims that might or might not be out there aren't going to get anything from the estate at this point. Right, because they're... You're not going to get a conviction on Jackson. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, for for victims, it's just knowing that other people know. Closure. You Exactly, that you get that, that closure. And that, and that could definitely be what it is for, you know, a lot of the, the kids who are, you know, obviously adults. Do you think there no. should be any concern from Jackson or his supporters that this will tarnish his memory? I mean, he's already got a, let's say, reputation. Right. Unproven, unconvicted, however you want to look at it. But There have been so many different documentaries that have come out since his death, you know, before his death. And he still has tons of fans. Right. You know, look at, um, you know, the concert that he was preparing for, you know, before his, his untimely death was sold out i think yeah. you know at that point and that's with everybody knowing everything the you know the different um documentaries that were out while he was still around people still you know still wanted to see him and still were fans of his so so the people that love michael jackson are, are gonna, gonna continue to love him right, no matter what and that aren't even gonna bother watching it or don't even care and you know fair point probably not going to sway any opinions at this point. absolutely The next news article that we had to talk about is the uh, overriding question, is Jason Reitman sexist? So Jason Reitman, being the son of former Ghostbusters director Ivan Reitman, is slated with helming the next edition of the Ghostbusters movie franchise. Now, from all accounts, this new Ghostbusters movie which is due out uh, July 10th of 2020, will be a proper sequel to Ghostbusters 2. In a recent interview, um, Jason Reitman uh, was quoted as saying, We are in every way trying to go back to the original technique and hand the movie back to the fans. Which seems like a noble and innocent statement until you look at the fact that the last one, the last Ghostbusters that came out, was an all-female cast, which in and of itself had taken heat for that. It was not in line with the Ghostbusters. It was a standalone movie. Um, so when you take that into account and you look at his statement, some people took it as he was bashing the 2016 reboot of the movie franchise. Leslie Jones, one of the stars of the 2016 mm -hmm. movie herself, took it that way, and took exception to his statement. She tweeted, quote, This is insulting like F us. We didn't count. It's something like Trump would do in a Trump voice. Going to redo Ghostbusters. Better with men will be huge. Those women ain't Ghostbusters. She goes on to say, Ugh, is so annoying. Such a D move. So clearly... She's a little upset about this. As I rightfully believe she should be. Because, so, you know, the movie was a success. It helped to bring more fans in to the fold. It gave little girls, you know, the the option to want to cosplay and be a Ghostbuster. You know, they, they could. And not to say that the original movie wasn't allowing it as as well but i think it was it was a positive role model you know image for for little girls that you know they can be scientists and they can be absolutely you know investigators and and stuff i enjoyed it i didn't yeah and you know. and you know i think the 2016 movie for a reboot movie was very well done uh they went out of their way to pay homage to the original absolutely. cast absolutely uh, in fact, one of the opening scenes, right? You know, it was was a tribute. Absolutely, and and that and 
that's where you know that there was love. Yes. You know, it wasn't like, um, we, we won't talk about it too much, you know, Star Wars, where here here's your lightsaber, Luke, and eh, screw it, throw it in the ocean. You know, everything that we just built up to in the last movie, yeah. eh, screw it. This was definitely, you know, the little tributes here and there, you know, was yeah, definitely was, a, a nice touch. It was tastefully done. It was well scripted. And it was done in the tradition of what we know of as Ghostbusters. So I think mm-hmm. overall, even though it wasn't as much of a success at the box office that people had hoped. Right. The movie itself, I think, was in a good tradition of the Ghostbusters. Absolutely. It took heat. Because it was an all-female cast. Right. Agree or disagree with that. This statement itself was interpreted as a statement directed at that all-female cast, I think, Mm -hmm. when it came out. Do you think he's sexist for making the comment? I think he's just a jerk. (laughs) Fair enough. Fair enough. Do you think the new movie is going to be a success in the wake of this and what is sure to follow as more controversy? I don't know, because honestly, you know, Ghostbusters, the original, you know, Ghostbusters 2 was okay. You know, it's the more you make kind of starts watering it down, you know, like where are you going to go with, you know, the the reboot of the reboot? Um, You know, how is it, you know, what took place, what didn't take place? You know, are you getting all the actors back that are clearly not all of them. well obviously not all of them um you know is there a need to do you really even need to you know how about something original how about a new movie that we haven't seen before let's not have characters that you know we've seen for 20 something years i agree and giving given the nature of the characters when we last saw them in ghostbusters 2 it's Hard to believe that they would be in a similar situation so many years later. Right. So working a script like that and making it plausible will be difficult. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, we'll see. July 10th, 2020 is the slated release date. No desire to see it, but anyway. (laughs) We will see if if Jason (laughs) Reitman is the director at the time. Right. Maybe it'll, you know, it'll be different, so. Yes. Uh, the last bit of news that we want to talk about this week, ending things, ending our news sec- segment on a positive note, is uh, the Beatles being record being smashed by Ariana Grande. That's impressive. That is impressive. Uh, her new album out, Thank You Next, has her sitting at the top of the Billboard charts. She is the first artist to occupy the number one, number two, and number three positions simultaneously on the Billboard Hot 100 song chart list since the Beatles did it in 1964. That is an impressive record to beat after so long. That is. I actually, I'm kind of surprised because going back to our, our other topic, Michael Jackson, the Thriller album had... Yeah you know hit after hit after hit i'm kind of surprised honestly that that wasn't you know the record breaker the record breaker you know right there well to her credit she also broke the record for the most simultaneous top 40 billboard hot 100 songs by a female at 11 the album had 12 songs on it all of which have made the top 100 11 of which made the top 40. Wow. The only one falling outside the top 40 was the song Makeup that fell at 48. So it was even in the top 50. Wow. Now that's impressive. That is impressive. And I guess today's theme is sort of, with some of the articles, is sort of a female empowerment theme today. Girl power. I think this is a fantastic <laughs> example for all the young ladies out there. Oh, absolutely. You can do. Well, and, and, and part of me also wonders how much different is it in the way we track things now versus it was back in 1964. You know, obviously the top 100 was based off of 
um, what airplay and sales and, and yes. things like that. Um, you know, and, and back then you could buy a single or you could buy, you know, a, a full album. Most people bought a full album where now, you know, I'd be interested to see how they calculate it versus, you know, obviously iTunes and Amazon and, and you know. I would venture to say that now they're, it would probably be more difficult now because of the level of granularity that you have tracking now from the digital environment. So you've mm. got MP3 sales. Right. You've got um, digital broadcast play, like mm -hmm. like iTunes uh, Radio. You've mm -hmm. got iHeartRadio. You've got Pandora. Pandora, right. All of these are reporting stats back for Billboard now. So now you didn't just say, oh, well, you bought – an album with 15 songs, two of which were good, and some of them got played. You didn't rely, you don't rely on on radio stations to play certain songs. Right, because now you're doing it yourself. Right. You're, you know, but if you're doing something like a Pandora or an iHeartRadio, you're putting in the search Ariana Grande. Right. Or you're, you know, so you're almost in some ways forcing... You are. You're basically... The number's forced. higher. So, you know, like, again... Most albums, you maybe, if you're lucky, you get three hits right. from it. But to say that, you know, 11 of the 12, I know I haven't heard all 11 or 12 of the songs on the radio. So, right. obviously, it's only the people that have bought the album or are doing the searches for it are finding all of these other songs. And that's why I songs. think digital media provides so much more exposure and so Absolutely. much more granularity in the reporting. Mm -hmm. And good for her. Um, so, yeah, I mean, comparing, you know, previous methods to current methods, I think, is certainly a valid point, but it's an incredible accomplishment. Oh, absolutely. Good for her. So the next segment that we have here are, is our insightful picks, where each week we're going to pick a... TV show, podcast, radio program, something along those lines, uh, and basically give a recommendation out to something that we enjoy or we think the audience is going to enjoy. Um, I'll let uh, Michelle go with her first insightful pick. So my insightful pick for this week would be a fabulous show that is on Amazon Prime. Uh just aired its second season a couple of months ago called The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. And I had heard various people talk about it and I watched it and I was hooked from the moment it started. Um, it it's, takes place in, you know, 1950s New York City. Um, you know, the, it follows the, uh, a newlywed and her ups and downs of um, marriage and raising a family and kind of her getting into a career in comedy very uh, b by accident and just how natural she is with it and how she has to hide it from her family. Um, and, you know, there's all other issues. Um, what I find really funny is that you know she's you know it's a jewish background um her parents are jewish her husband's jewish and so there's a lot of these you know things you know being jewish in new york city in 1950s you know that that remind me of my parents and and different things so you know obviously if you're not jewish it, you know some of the jokes might not hit you but it's just funny to see you know what women went through you know, like she measures herself every day to make sure that she's still the same size. Um, she wakes up a half hour before her husband does to do her hair and makeup and goes back to bed so that when her husband wakes up, she looks like, you know, <laughs> she's she's refreshed, um, you know, and, and that's what women did, you know, and then you see her mother do it, too. So obviously she learned how to do it you know, from, you know, from her mother and stuff. And it's just such a, an amazing cast and um, just a great show. And like I said, it's two seasons now. 
a nice little plot twist at the end of uh, the second season. So, of course, you know, waiting for the, the third to even, you know, they haven't even started filming it yet. But, you know, I know this past award season, it won tons of different awards for best comedy and best actress and supporting cast and everything. And it's just just an overall great, great show. That's a great pick. I haven't watched a lot of it. I did watch a couple of episodes mm-hmm. with you. The one striking thing that I took away from it was the authenticity of the sets and the costumes. Oh, absolutely. Spot on. They did a fantastic job. You legitimately feel like this Mm -hmm. show, you know, aside from the fact that it's filmed in color, you feel like it's filmed in the 1950s. Absolutely. Absolutely. So big on authenticity. Mm -hmm. So my insightful pick also was another one set in the 1950s. Uh, is a television show. It's in its first season on History Channel called Project Blue Book. It airs Tuesdays at 10 on the History Channel, which, of course, we don't watch it then. We watch it <laughs> streaming on demand. Going back to that first topic that we had of yes, people don't, that don't watch TV when it actually airs. Don't watch live TV. <laughs> this is a dramatized version of actual cases that were investigated by the Air Force during Project Blue Book, which was the Air Force's investigation into the UFO phenomenon in the 1950s and 60s. It's basically taking you down the path of the Air Force, trying to find plausible explanations to a lot of the unexplained sightings that were out there. It's been loosely described as X-Men, X-Files meets Mad Men. I could definitely see that. And again, it follows Dr. Hynek and his Air Force counterpart, and they investigate each, each week a different case. Um, and there's obviously an underlying plot generator that's, that's mm-hmm. building over the entire season. Um, but the authenticity and the faithfulness to the actual Project Blue Book cases, some of which I've actually, the show spawned me to go do research on. Mm-hmm. I'm very impressed with how uh, factually correct these shows are mm-hmm. to the actual accounts. Um, being a history buff myself, the one thing that I criticize movies and TV shows about that are historically based is when they deviate from that history mm-hmm. for the right. sake of story. Purpose. Right, you always get mad at that. Um, but the great thing about Project Blue Book is it's that good. The real Project Blue Book cases are that good that you don't need to fictionalize, fictionalize right, them. Right, right. Um, and, you know, there's, you know, some underlying uh, fictionalized relationship things that go on in the show that, you know you have the whole russians and yeah yeah. and that stuff doesn't really come out too much in the actual project blue book accounts right it just helps to add a little spice to it so and that's really what it is that's that's the creative license and i Mm -hmm. think if i'm comfortable if they keep the creative license of the stuff that's not related to project blue book i'm fine with that but the stuff that is related to the actual accounts Mm -hmm is spot on and they do a fantastic mm-hmm. job with it yeah i i the, i was the one that actually told you about the show because i had seen coming attractions for it and right. i was like oh i think this is something you're gonna like yeah yay me and it's a fantastic show and, yep. and i recommend everyone check it out i'm eagerly looking forward to the season conclusion here to see mm-hmm. where they're going with it yep this conclusion of this podcast will Mark the actual publication of the last three that we've done, finally. Dun, dun, dun. So if you're listening to this one, uh, this is four weeks in, because we did skip last week because we were traveling. Right. Um, and we had the two previous ones that we did. So we will officially be published with this podcast. Uh, we will have contact information soon for you to provide feedback to us. We don't have that set up quite yet. Mm-hmm. Um. And that's it. We'll see you next week with uh, another set of uh, interesting topics to talk about. I look forward to it. Thank you so much for your time, Michelle. Thank you so much, Joe. And goodbye to our audience.